welcome to the Kościuszka Foundation's webinar, My Country's Other Names, Poland's New Wave Poets of the 1970s with Jarosław Anders. My name is Ewa Zadworna. I'm Director of Cultural Affairs at the Foundation, and I want to thank all participants for taking time out and joining us here on Zoom. For over 200 years, poetry has occupied a special place in Polish literature. After the loss of Poland's independence at the end of 18th century, it was the poetry that became a vehicle of national identity. Later on, it was the poetry that assumed the duty to shape civic atti attitudes, and it was in poetry, Paul sought comfort and consolations in the most dramatic moments in the country's turbulent history. Our today's presentation will shine light on one of Poland's major poetic formations known as the New Wave or Generation 68, which dominated the Polish poetic landscape in the late 1960s and 1970s. This is the first episode treating on this particular subject. There are two other talks, two other episodes, which elaborate on other aspects of the new wave formation, which will be presented in the spring. The presentations on Poland's new wave poets are organized and co-hosted together with the Polish program at Hunter College CUNY with Dr. and with Dr. Małgorzata Pośpiech, who is in charge of the program at Hunter, who will lead the discussion later on, and whom I have the pleasure of introducing to you. Dr. Pośpiech is a writer, documentary filmmaker, a journalist, published translator, and a photographer. She's an author of numerous publications, including novels, a Small Town and Ariadna's Labyrinth, which were nominated for the Central Europe Literary Award in 2015 and 2018, respectively. She's author of other novels, collection of poems, poems and published translations. Dr. Poshpiv, thank you very much for the initiative of hosting this series of this talk and welcome on the Foundation's online programs. Thank you so much, Ms. Zadvorna. Uh, I would like to thank you, you and the Kosciuszko Foundation for inviting us and co-organizing the event. We have an eminent uh, writer, translator and um, famous, um, famous figure in Polish literary world. Jarosław Anders, so it's a really pleasure to uh, host him at, at begin, and to begin the series of talks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to yes, also introduce to you uh, the man of the hour and the speaker of uh, our today's webinar, a writer, translator, and editor, Jarosław Anders. Mr. Anther Anders is the author of Between Fire and Sleep, essays on modern Polish Poetry and Prose, published by the Yale University Press in 2009. He is also the author of numerous articles published in the New York Review of Books, The New Republic, The Los Angeles Times Book Review, and other publications. He has translated several books from English into Polish and from Polish into English. In the past, he served as the writer and broadcaster for The Voice of America, and he worked in the Bureau of Democracy human rights and labor of the US Department of State. A little over a year ago in the pre-pandemic era where when events were held live, we had a, a pleasure of hosting Mr. Anders' talk on uh, Mare Kwasko at the Foundation's House in New York. Uh, Mr. Anders, uh, welcome again. This time we are connecting virtually and thank you very much for accepting our invitation to give this talk to our audience. And now, without further ado, I'm turning this virtual podium of ours to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Malgozata and Eva, for uh, inviting me and putting this event together. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to talk about uh, a group of writers, a poetic formation, uh, predominantly poets, uh, who are also by generation. That means uh, the world they uh, lived in and the world they tried to describe was also my world. Mm, and also because this group is less known, uh, I think, in the United States as a group, individual members uh, are known, especially Adam Zagajewski, who is probably the most renowned Polish poet today, and uh, Stanisław Barańczak, uh, who spent many years here in the United States uh, teaching Polish literature at Harvard. 
the names of others equally interesting in my uh, in my view, uh, Richard Krynicki, Julian Kornhauser, or Eva Lipska are probably less familiar. Uh, and uh, this group we are talking about today were pretty much a group phenomenon. Uh, let me start uh, with a few lines of, uh, from a poem by uh, Richard Krynicki, uh, The Wall, translated by Stanisław Balenczak and Claire Kavana, uh, from which I borrowed the title uh, of this talk. But I would also like to dedicate this, this poem, this, this fragment of the poem, uh, to my uh, Belarusian friends, some of whom may be watching me right now, and who are living through their own very dramatic and also hopeful um, events. Looking at the concrete wall, the barbed wire, and the steel gate, for a minute, I couldn't remember my country's other names. And that was Richard Krynicki. Uh, let it be our motto today. Uh, what is a literary generation? Of course, a group of writers born around the same time, starting their literary careers, publishing their first books also around the same time. But most importantly, uh, it is a group that is sharing some common formative uh, experience. Uh, the common experience does not need to uh, translate automatically into a similar style uh, of expression or similar poetics, uh, but there usually is a similar concept or understanding of literature, of its role in culture, and also uh, the role of a writer and its, uh, the writer's obligations. According to this definition, uh, the writers we are uh, talking about today were definitely a literary uh, generation. Most of them were born between the years 1945 and 1950, give and take a couple of years, which means they were the first fully post-war uh, generation without even vague childhood memories uh, of the war. Um, their literary debuts uh, also happened within uh, a few years of each other between the late 60s and early 70s. And the event that shaped their experience uh, took place in Poland in 1968 and 1970. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit about those events and what they meant in Polish history. The year 1968, uh, that was the year I was graduating from, uh, from high school, uh, was uh, a particularly eventful uh, year pretty much everywhere. Here in the United States, there were political assassinations of Martin Luther King, of Robert Kennedy, protests against the war in Vietnam, violent racial uh, conflicts, uh, flower children and police violence, uh, also student protests. In Western Europe, leftist students uh, who call themselves Maoists or Trotskys were bu building barricades uh, and battling police in the streets of Paris and some other cities. In Czechoslovakia, uh, we had the Prague Spring, probably the last attempt to reform and liberalize uh, social, Soviet-style socialism, an attempt that was, of course, crushed uh, during the Warsaw Pact uh, intervention. Uh, and in Poland, we had the so-called March events. Uh, students and Polish intelligentsia uh, took to streets to demonstrate against a particularly uh, ugly <clears throat> case of censorship, uh, with uh, protests quickly assuming a much broader political scope. Those brothers were also brutally crushed by the police, uh, with many young people uh, beaten, uh, thrown in jail, uh, many having their lives and their whole careers uh, <clears throat> broken. Uh, on that occasion, the, the government also unleashed an ugly anti-Semitic campaign, trying to present the protesters as Zionists, a code name for Jews, an alien element uh, bent on destroying the People's Poland, that was the official propaganda. Many of the young poets we are talking about were students at that time, uh, or young, uh, young uh, uh, graduates, and participated in those events, or at least were uh, shocked, traumatized uh, observers. Uh, Baranczak will uh, write later in uh, one of his uh, books that it was in the year 1968, our eyes and heads uh, opened. And then two years later, we had the Polish December of 1970. Uh, the government uh, inexplicably 
uh, announced major food price hikes shortly before Christmas. Workers, worker strikes and demonstrations um, erupted mainly in the Polish coastal times, the towns uh, Gdańsk, Gdynia, Elbląg, Szczecin. They were crushed even more brutally than the student protests uh, of 1968. The government deployed uh, army uh, with tanks, heavy armor. In Gdynia, the military opened fire at shipyard workers just getting off uh, a commuter train at the shipyard uh, stop. Um, hundreds were wounded and, and some were killed. Altogether, it is estimated that about uh, 40 people uh, died during uh, those unrests and over a thousand were wounded. Thousands were, of course, um, arrested. Um, it was the end of something in Poland, the end of a period that was sometimes uh, referred to as uh, the little uh, stabilization. The term, by the way, um, is uh, from uh, the title of Tadeusz Uzevich's uh, play, uh, 1964 play, Witnesses or Our Little Stabilization. Um, stabilization, a period of uh, relative calm in, in social life in Poland, started in 1956 with the official destalinization, the thaw, or the period of very relative and very, very short-lived, as it turns out, uh, liberalization in uh, politics, in social life, in, uh, in culture. Uh, the old Leninist slogan, who is not with us is against us, actually it was not Lenin who is at first, was replaced with something like, who is not openly against us, well, let's say is really with us. Uh, people were no longer living in constant fear. Material uh, conditions improved slightly. There was an increased access to foreign literature. Yeah, travel to the West was still very difficult and very expensive, but already possible, especially if you had good friends um, uh, or family abroad. Uh, people were allowed to live as long as they behaved themselves, um, paid occasional lip service to the regime and its ideology, and writers were allowed to write, experiment, explore new modes of expression, as long as what they expressed, what they wrote, did not openly contradict, defy the basic tenets of Marxism-Leninism. Uh, it can be argued that the writers that we are talking about, that this, this generation, my generation, were uh, the children of the little stabilization, uh, whose adulthood, early, early adult, years coincided with the time, the moment, when the stabilization started to break down. A new restlessness was uh, settling in, new ambitions and desires were waking up, leading to a series of political crisis, uh, unrest, culminating, of course, in the rise of solidarity in 1980. So we have this group of <clears throat> young and aspiring writers, poets for the most part, feeling those new tensions, charges in the air, uh, looking around the Polish literary scene of that time, uh, searching for places for themselves, for models to, to emulate, and they notice that something is missing. The world they, they, they know, the reality they rubbed against, often painfully, the experiences they, they share uh, are not there. They are not reflected, not represented, not explored artistically in the writings of their slightly older colleagues. What they see around in Polish literature at that time was objectively speaking quite diverse and, and interesting. Uh, after 1956, when uh, the uh, socialist realism dictates uh, were removed, we know what socialist realism is, uh, we don't have to define the, the notion, uh, Polish literature really exploded in many different di directions. Uh, there were at least three generations of writers active at that time. There were the so-called late debuts writers born in the 20s who could not or would not publish their books earlier. Uh, one of them was Wigniew Herbert, who uh, published uh, some poems in magazines in uh, the 1940s, and then went silent for many years, uh, publishing his first uh, book, his first volume of poetry, um, only in 1956. Another one was Miron Białoszewski, probably the most interesting representative of the so-called linguistic poetry that focused on uh, a language and the process of communication, its traps, semantic surprises hidden in seemingly simple words and expressions. Um, 
there were also poets who were active before uh, and uh, sometimes accepted, if not embraced, the social, socialist realism, the realist mode of writing, uh, who after 1956 uh, displayed a totally different poetic persona, were kind of reborn as poets. Uh, Wisława Szymborska was, was one of them, but there were, were, were many others. Uh, one of the poetic schools that developed um, after 1956, um, and here we can talk about a school rather than a generation, uh, was called uh, Polish classicism, uh, of which Zbigniew Herbert was again, uh, the most prominent uh, example representative. It was uh, a kind of poetry that tried to confront the horrors of, of the war, which were still very fresh in the memory and the horrors of Stalinism, which were even fresher, um, by presenting them, placing them against a broad background uh, of history, history of civilization, um, by referring to mythologies, archetypes, by showing some universal historical patterns by underscoring uh, values and moral imperatives uh, they saw as universally valid. Uh, they, they often used language, the language of parables, Aesopian language. That was clear enough uh, for the readers. You read about something happening in ancient road, Rome and you immediately projected it on, on, onto uh, in events in, in, in Polish history. Uh, the purpose of this poetry uh, was probably to counter the sense of chaos, of despair, uh, to purify, uh, dignify, elevate the language and restore uh, a sense of balance and continuity in the lives of individuals uh, and the lives of the nation. Uh, this poetry is still widely read and still very important in, in Polish, in, in Polish uh, consciousness. But there were other many styles, of course, there was Tadeusz Ruzevich, who in his sparse, naked, poetic diction uh, was, me, uh, was, was meditating on what, if anything, uh, survived in the moral universe after the catastrophe of the war. Uh, some turned to pure aesthetics, to formal innovation. Uh, but among, among this diversity, uh, there was perhaps one common feature. Uh, steering clear of any direct engagement with uh, contemporaneous realities as it they perceived and experienced in the time. And it was easy to guess why it was so. Engaging with reality truthfully, honestly, would inevitably uh, lead uh, to, uh, to a clash, a conflict with uh, the powers that be. Uh, liberalization or not, you know, the state was still a, an ideological state and uh, it maintained full control over culture and publishing. If you didn't want to have to lie, it was better to stay away from some subjects. This at least was a widely accepted strategy, a kind of mantra of the little uh, stabilization until the new wave came. Um, a good example of this strategy of uh, artful evasion was a group of young poets, almost contemporaries of, of the new wave, just a few years older, uh, that formed itself in Warsaw in the student club Hybride and became known as uh, the Poetic Orientations Hybride or simply Orientations. Um, it was a very enterprising group of poets and critics uh, skillful in self-promotion, um, uh, having in the midst a few good organizers. Uh, poetically, they were very diverse. Politically, they, they tried to, at least uh, initially, to look forward powerful official sponsors, one of them being, I believe, uh, the Association of Polish-Soviet uh, Friendship. Um, Sometimes they 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 they, la they laughed poetic uh, poetic uh, uh, competitions. They launch a lot of them with usually very trite ideological terms like Lenin's idea, Lenin and the world today, born in struggle, our twenty years, the twenty years of, of people's Poland, the sources of new era, and so on and so on. Sometimes, actually, very often, poems submitted to, for those competitions had very little uh, to do with those ostensible subjects. And if they did, they treated those subjects as a kind of pretext, safe, safe alibi to deploy their, their poetic craft. 
The group had several very talented individuals uh, in their orbit. Uh, Jerzy Gurzański, Zbigniew Jerzyna, Krzysztof Gonsiorowski, Jarosław Markiewicz, Barbara Sadowska, Krzysztof Karasek, and some of them later gravitated towards uh, the new wave. Uh, the poetic language and the poetic skills could be quite impressive. I give you a couple of examples, for instance. The sky, the vessel of seeing, clouds, so many, resembling dogs. Look over there, beyond the visible layer, a great barking runs from star to star. That was Zbigniew Jerzyna, sky clouds. Or something like that. Um, ice flows were floating on the backs as if someone was born. In the city's glow, I was burning roots. A child walking by was singing like a javelin. That was Vicente Ruzanski. Not bad, that was actually quite good, uh, at least not about Lenin and building socialism. But what does it have to do with anything? Anything that we were experiencing and, uh, and seeing uh, every day uh, around us, with anything that was actually happening uh, in our lives? Where was the reality? Uh, these were the, the questions the poets of the new wave and many of the readers were asking and looking for answers. Um, are they uh, the right questions to ask poetry? It's an open issue. We're not going to solve it here. But their response was a resounding yes, uh, if not in general, at least in this specific historical moment, this place and time that was Poland in the late 60s and 70s. After all, people were again being beaten, even killed in the streets of Polish towns and writing about clouds barking like dogs or children singing like javelins uh, seemed uh, too easy, too easy form of freedom, uh, too safe kind of autonomy. Uh, not by accident, actually, this, this sort of poetry was not only tolerated, but encouraged uh, by, by the cultural authorities. It did not pose any threat to them. It did not um, engender any moral discomfort. Well, these questions started to appear in print in articles published mainly in low circulation um, student periodicals and later in several books. The first one was Stanisław Baranczak's Nieufni i Zadufani, Doubters and Believers, followed by Świat Nieprzedstawiony, The Unrepresented World, uh, written jointly by Julian Kornhauser and Adam Zagajewski. The final one was Spur o Poesie, a debate about poetry, a collection of uh, essays by a group of poets and critics. <clears throat> the authors of the unrepresented world, probably the most seminal and widely debated voice in this discussion, called for literature, in fact, a whole culture that pays attention to the details of life rather than generalities, that acknowledges the conditions in which it is created and uh, received. They called for literature that plays an epistemic and ethical role, not only an aesthetic, epistemic, that means used as a tool of knowledge, as a tool of uh, learning about the world. We want literature, they wrote, that describes, here I quote, what is today the source of despair, enchantment, hatred, fear, love, and faith. A literature that contains the new exotic, uncertain human world, corroborates its form, creates a map of being. Uh, as we see, ethical considerations were very important for them. Uh, poetry that was not grounded in, uh, in ethics appeared to them as detached from life and pretty useless. Uh, they called for, they also called for an enhanced um, attention to the language as it is actually used by people of the generation outside literature. The language that, again, I quote, that lives in our brains and in our refrigerators in which we make friends and establish re relations, which distorts our judgments and helps us to lie. Uh, it was mostly about the institutional language that was pouring out constantly every minute from the government controlled media, um, falsifying, denying re reality. This language needed to be investigated, analyzed, unmasked, deconstructed, we would say today. Uh, one of the notions they introduced was linguistic criticism, poetry about language, but not about language in general, but specifically 
about the language of the media, political slogans, um, and everyday communications. They warned uh, both Kornhauser slash Zagayevsky in their book and Baranchak in his book of the excess of poetic self-confidence, excessive belief in a poet's exalted uh, position of a prophet, a bard, um, uh, someone uh, endowed with uh, unusual uh, superhuman insight into existence, someone with uh, uncommon creative powers. They advised uh, self-irony, self-doubt. Baranczak especially speaks about poetry of questions rather than uh, declarations, about dialectical thinking in poetry. That means every thesis immediately evokes an antithesis. Uh, poetry, uh, Baranczak wrote in one of his essays, should be a form of distrust, criticism, unmasking. It should be all this until the last lie, the last demagoguery, the last act of violence disappears from the earth. A rather maximalist program, one could say. Um, they had a rather complex, um, uh, ambiguous attitude towards the classicists that I described earlier uh, and their tradition, including poets like uh, Herbert or Szymborska, uh, who did, after all, attempt to comment on uh, the political reality, uh, the social reality, but did it indirectly by generalizing and mythologizing it uh, by using this Aesopian language. Uh, the new wave, po uh, wave poets uh, respected them. You see from their critiques that they respected them very highly, but also found them uh, inadequate uh, considering their own program and their own needs. Uh, they were interested in here and now. They are always repeating, we are living here and now and not in some timeless uh, cosmos of culture. The language of the classicists uh, was for them too calm, too stoical. Uh, Richard Krinitsky wrote a poem, uh, Language is Raw Meat, uh, and it's dedicated to Mr. Herbert and Mr. Cogito. Mr. Cogito is a persona that appears frequently in uh, uh, Herbert's poems. Mm -hmm. And it goes uh, more or less like uh, that. A language is raw meat that swells in the wound, an open wound of the mouth, the mouth that feeds on lying truths. Language is a heart beating outside, a naked heart, a naked blade, which is a defenseless weapon. That gag that chokes, the lost uprisings of words, this animal with human teeth, tamed every day, this inhuman something that grows inside us and outgrows us, this animal fed on poisoned flesh, the red flag we swallow and spit out with our blood, that something split in two that surrounds us, the true lie that tempts, this child that learns the truth and truly lies. Uh, we can see, even in my very quick translation, this emotional te tension, anger, uh, strings of ox oxymorons, self-contradictions, trashing back and forth in a semantic trap. There was something very different from what you hear in, in Herbert's poetry, and, so in, and very different from anything that you heard in, in Polish poetry at that time. It was, there was a new tone, a new idiom um, that, that this poetry introduced. Uh, how about reality? Uh, the words reality, real, factual, actual, uh, appear in, uh, in, in, this critical, in, in their critical writing uh, with, with great frequency. So are terms like representation, directness, exploration, engagement, uh, and find the truth. Uh, in fact, all those words might have been in themselves a kind of code or, or cover. Uh, we understood at that time quite well what it was really about. It was about a literature of dissent, a literature of political protest, an indirect elliptical uh, protest, but protest nevertheless. And it is paradoxical that calling for directness, for saying things as they are, they also practiced, those, those writers, uh, a form of camouflage. Um, well, it was an admission that uh, in those years, at least, uh, there existed quite real and definite boundaries and to directness. Um, were they calling for a new realism, 
not socialist realism, but realism nevertheless, um, a sociological reportage, perhaps a political polemic uh, in verse. Uh, that was not the case, uh, although they did not specify how exactly it is to be done. Balanchak said in his book that reality with all its tensions and contradictions uh, uh, should be uh, expressed uh, through the very structure of the poem, including linguistic structure. The very form should be doubting, questioning, with realist form, certainly, uh, with realism, of course, it was, was not. That was the theory, uh, the passionate calls, denunciations. Uh, theoretically, they left some gaps. Did they achieve, and if so, uh, in what way and to what degree, um, what, uh, what they so passionately uh, preached? It is, of course, very difficult to talk about any group of poet, po poets in general. And this poet, uh, group of poets was, was very diverse. It is hard to find a formula um, that would fit them all. Um, the writing was diverse also, uh, of each of them was also diverse, either diachronically, that means going through different phases, sometimes synchronically practicing different styles and different genres uh, simultaneously. Um, sometimes it was moving between extremes, even within, um, within this relatively short period of time that was the new wave. The answer, uh, to answer these questions, what should probably devote much more time uh, to, to individual poems, poets, which I hope we'll have an opportunity to do. But let me say uh, a few brief, uh, brief words uh, by the way of introduction about each one of them. Let me stop for a moment and ch chat, uh, see because I see something on, on the chat. Uh, no, that is not, that is not for me. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so Stanisław Balanczak and Richard Krynicki um, were probably uh, more than others interested in those linguistic criticism, uh, the, the linguistic criticism aspects of, um, uh, of writing. Especially many of Balanczak's poems are full of uh, word games, puns. His poetry is also closest to, the, to political protest verse. Uh, some of his poems are in fact uh, witty political feuilletons uh, in verse. Uh, personally, he was also gravitating towards political activism. They all were, and later uh, in, in the 70s, uh, they were signing protest letters, edited Samizdat underground uh, periodicals. They were all blacklisted, lost their jobs, um, had to publish uh, um, underground or abroad and publish reviews in Paris or London. Uh, but Eintracht was possibly the most involved in, in the sort of hands-on daily uh, opposition activity. After 1976, um, he became an active member of, of the Democratic Opposition, the, the Committee for the Defense of Workers. Uh, he lost his job at the University of Poznan. He was invited uh, to take over the chair of uh, Polish literature uh, in Harvard unfortunately died much too early at age 68 in um, 2014. Uh, there is a sample of his you know, political poetry, kind of direct, direct po uh, political poetry called the Three Magi, um, translated by Baranchak and Kavana. Uh, they will probably come just after the new year. As usual, early in the morning, the forceps of the doorbell will pull you out by the head from under the bedclothes. Dazed as a newborn baby, you'll open the door. The star of an ID will flash before your eyes. We know very well, you know, we can understand clearly what kind of visit he's writing about. It's the visit of the police coming early in the morning uh, to, to search your apartment. When he left Poland, his poetry started to evolve uh, in many seemingly contradictory directions, there was metaphysics, existential meditations on death, uh, passionate love poetry, but also light verse, comedy, linguistic, equilibri equilibristics, this time apparently liberated from any uh, higher serious purpose, just done for pure joy. Richard Krynicki was a bit older than, than the others. He was, was actually born during the war. Um, 
and in, in a sense is uh, is the precursor. Um, he's uh, also in uh, was also interested in dissecting uh, the language and finding its hidden ironies. He started as a poet of plentitude, a bit like Whitman or Allen Ginsberg, you know, this elemental, spontaneously rushing poetry, only to move uh, later, again, not unlike Allen Ginsberg, towards more aesthetic uh, tears form influenced by Japanese poetry. He's a master of short epi epigrammatic verses. Uh, he wrote haiku, he wrote um, uh, sequences of koans, you know, the Buddhist proverbs or, or anecdotes that are usually built on some uh, seeming paradox. Adam Zagajewski was always the most intellectual uh, of them, intellectual in his writing, because uh, in private they were all intellectuals, very highly uh, well-educated people. He was always interested in philosophy. He actually taught philosophy at some, some point in a, uh, in a college of mining engineering, a kind of philosophy one-on-one -on -one for future uh, mining engineers. Um, he was interested in history of art, uh, in music. He liked confronting the elevated ideas um, of philosophers, the highest achievements of art with reality observed every day in Poland. Um, later, when he uh, lived for several years in Paris, the subject matter of his poetry also changed considerably from political protest to philosophical, even religious meditations on the nature, the sources of beauty, enchantment, ecstasy in this imperfect, wounded uh, world. Eva Lipska um, is usually counted among the new wave poets. Uh, I do count her among the new wave poets because she, she shared, uh, uh, shares a lot of uh, characteristics with them, but she has always been a world uh, apart. She's probably the most private, the lyrical voice of this generation. Uh, we see uh, her complex poetic tropes uh, constantly shifting between the private and public, internal and external forms of isolation and vulnerability, each being a correlate of the other. Um, and she's a poet of contrasts, transitions, verbal surprises. Linguistic matter um, in her poem, uh, poems is highly original, sometimes stunningly original, but the purpose of her uh, linguistic uh, experiments seem to be focused rather on evoking a deep subconscious Freudian, uh, Jungian associations that surge up, you know, through language uh, in our consciousness, uh, rather than like in the case of Baran Baranchak, um, uh, looking for, you know, the, the, trying to de de deconstruct the official language of lies. Uh, her poetry is marked by death. Uh, usually it is the approaching death of, of another. And also by, by memory, by circular returns uh, of the past, uh, which are also interestingly reflected in, in, in her poetry structure and constant returns, her constant returns to earlier poems and either rewriting them or incorporating them in new poems, sometimes giving them new meanings or sometimes even reversing their, their meanings. Um, poetically, uh, practically, I mean, the, the, only, uh, the only volume of, po of her poetry that is much in, in, the, in the mode of, of the new wave political engagement was called Trachowalnia Ciemności, the storehouse of, of darkness. There is one um, uh, poem from this, this volume called An Attempt, translated again by Baranchak and Kavana. When we tried to talk to one another, it turned out that we had different languages. Just as we began to speak a common tongue, they took our speech away. As we descended from the hills, we shared only the shadows of the dead. And again, this poem can speak about two lovers who learn to communicate and then suddenly lose this, this ability to communicate, or about the nation that finds a common language, can finally express, its, express itself only to, to, to have this ability taken away brutally by, uh, by the powers. Um, Julian Kornhauser uh, sometimes was called an expressionist, probably due to his very uh, earlier um, 
very restless, phantasmagoric poems. Uh, but he's also a very contemplative uh, writer, a seeker of personal authenticity, observing, probing his own reactions, ethical, aesthetic, intellectual uh, to, to the surrounding uh, reality. Uh, he is an ironist, self-ironist, and also a great overhearer. Uh, during martial law, he wrote a series of poems collected in the volume, in the volume, the, the, the book was published in 1982 um, uh, in, in Sami's that uh, Haray, uh, based on seemingly, seemingly based on overheard, awkward, often ungrammatical phrases of people in the streets. Uh, and he's uncovering uh, in them unexpected beauty, sometimes unexpected truth hidden under the rough, uh, rough su surface and, uh, and the lies. Um, just in, in, like in the poetry of Miron Bielorzewski. Uh, in a sense, his poetry uh, always strikes me as um, being the most uh, compassionate uh, of, of, of the whole uh, group. Uh, for him, even Homo Sovieticus, a party apparatchik, a manager of a st st state enterprise, um, a scared, petty bureaucrat, is for him a uh, homo, that means a human being worthy of not our scorn, but, but of scrutiny and even sympathy. He listens to the way they talk. They try to explain the world to themselves, the, the way they try to reassure themselves that they are still normal people. There is one, uh, one of those poems that's called Don't Hide Behind Generalities. And it's, the speaker is probably a, a party propagandist, uh, a low level party propagandist who has to explain to his comrades uh, the current events. Any pretext is good for, to start a brawl. In conflict situations, everybody is an expert. Hence the misuse of such words as rule of law or social interest, when in fact, this is not what it's all about. What it is really about, we don't know yet. Every piece of news with a disclaimer, people say, but there are also facts. A letter with a heading, Dear TV, bread first, democracy later. Also, peeling plaster and money collections. Um, so you see how different they all were. Uh, they evolved in different ways. Um, they, uh, uh, they, they moved in different directions, but the poetry in the, in the 70s and 80s does have something in common to a patient and careful reader. Uh, some of their po poems, as I said, uh, can be read at political feuilletons, satires, vignettes, of very recognize, uh, rec easy, easily recognizable situations. Uh, but most of them, uh, the best one, I would say, are highly elliptical, with, uh, which, which seems to contradict uh, their call for concreteness and specificity. They do not give you a portrait of reality, it's mirror image, but they give you a sense of that reality, the, its atmosphere, the atmosphere of living in Poland um, of that time. Uh, their abstraction symbols seem to have very real and specific designates uh, that were quite obvious to their contemporary readers. Uh, for example, one of the best known uh, poems by Stanisław Barańczak, uh, In One Breath, uh, is simply a description of a person breathing or rather gasping and is as in a state of panic. In one breath, within one bracket of breath, closing a sentence, within one bracket of ribs around the heart, around a slender fish of expiration, in one breath to close everything and to enclose oneself in everything. We don't know anything about the situation. Uh, what is really happening to this person? Uh, but the central figure uh, of breathing or actually hyperventilating, uh, quite fre frequent in Baranchak's poetry and, and in the poetry of the whole group actually, uh, brings in a whole crowd of other images. They start branching out into keywords such as fist, heart, fish, fish in a net, uh, flame, a flame scorching the lungs, prison walls, bones, blood streaming on concrete. So despite this abstractness, there is something very 
painfully concrete and very pain painfully real behind it. It's not just a, a poet's vision, it's something that poet imagined sitting up in his in his uh, in his uh, armchair. There was something that he knew, at least heard about, and and that touched him very very uh, directly. Um, but there are other poems. Of course, Brian Chuck wrote, wrote also a poem from the same volume, early volume, about a person who decides apparently for the first time in his life not to raise his hand at the meeting and, and not to vo vote with everybody else. The great act of courage. Um, the poems were often written in, uh, in the second person singular. Uh, instead of an implied narrator or lyrical self, uh, there is an implied listener, as if the speaker was trying to stand outside himself or herself, uh, talking to a real or imaginary uh, friend. Uh, this is a frequent poetic trope, poetic figure of loneliness. Uh, but it's it is also a, a slightly desperate search for commonality. The tone of the voice seems to be a, a dramatic whisper, you know, hey, are you there? Are you listening? We're in it together, right? Uh, there is a and, and, and general ubiquitous sense of anger, strife, tension, <clears throat> disagreement. And it is clear that the object of this disagreement is the whole structure of reality, uh, the political uh, system. The reality is invariably hostile, menacing, alien, suffocating, uh, or at least unbearably ugly, gray and depressing. It is cold both literally and metaphorically. The motif of uh, winter, uh, as one of Polish critics noted, uh, appears in those poems very frequently and assumes the role of a political and existential uh, symbol. Uh, it's not a, a beauty, the beautiful countryside winter or a winter somewhere in the mountains, but gray, dirty, slushy city winter. And everything that transpires in those decorations um, assumes its, its, its aura. Uh, there is a sense of almost physical agony and defenseless fear, anxiety, something constantly sneaking up on us, um, expressed through uh, frequent biological, anatomical, medical metaphors, as if the body was the, the last bastion uh, of autonomy, the last refuge, but was also constantly threatened both from without and from within. There was also irony, uh, even humor, usually of the dark kind, uh, a sense of, uh, of the grotesque, uh, the ridiculousness of all that, that sometimes subtly undercuts the emotional uh, burden uh, of, of those poems. Um, these were the main tropes, metaphors, symbols of the poetry. Um, did they manage to represent the unrepresented reality uh, of the 60s and the 70s? Did they achieve that, that goal, that postulate? Perhaps not directly, almost certainly not directly, and not literally. But this poetry uh, to us speak, speaks and still does, you know, speak. Um, they, they did uh, express something of our fears our anxieties and our moral, moral dilemmas uh, faced by the young generation uh, who were entirely, you know, alienated, entering their adult life, uh, looking for strategies for, for survival. These were pretty gloomy and depressing years, mm, especially when, when you, you graduated from college, we, you lived for a few years, a kind of bohemian life uh, trying not to sell out, uh, scrapping by. Uh, by that you approached 30, perhaps you already had a family, uh, and started to wake up at night thinking what the rest of my life is going to be like. Um, shall I reach some kind of compromise and try to build a career, try to be good at what I'm good at, or shall I never compromise and uh, accept lifelong uh, marginalization. Uh, those poems in those states, in those moments, 
uh, were, were for us a, a common currency, a common point of reference, um, some kind of code of mutual uh, understanding. Um, so for us, at least, for I'm speaking about my generation, uh, there was a kind of psychological realism in those um, writings that made us recognize the world in which both the reader and the author jointly dwelt or in which they were jointly imprisoned. We recognize the whole emotional frame, framework of claustrophobia, anxiety, anxiety about the future and anxiety about preserving our inner autonomy, our, our decency. Uh, we recognized uh, the irony, the painful irony uh, about the tremendous waste um, of creative energy um, of what we believed were our already wasted lives, you know. You enter, you enter adulthood, you look for a job and you realize that you're already done in, you know, in a sense, you're already, you're, you're already wasted. Um, so this poetry did carry and, and still carries, as I said, um, perhaps for only for us, the sights and the sounds, uh, smells of our existence, fragments that keep returning to us in the most unexpected moments. Mm, it was our reality, uh, even though we politically rejected it. We were not visitors there, not tourists. It formed and shaped us. It actually, it's, it, it cannot be denied. So we read this poetry as a kind of collective, intimate uh, confession to each other, a reassurance that we actually existed together in a particular place and time. The place remains, the place remains, changed in some ways, and in some ways did not change that much. Uh, the time, the mood of the time is luckily no more. So what remains? What is left? Um, let me finish with, um, uh, I wanted to, we still have some time. Uh, I have two, two poems with which I wanted to finish, uh, fragments of poems. Uh, and I read, uh, read both of them. Uh, one is a poem by Stanislav Baranja called What Will Be a Testimony? What will be the testimony of the time? Not history, he says in his, his poems, not books, not newspapers, not even our censored or self-censored letters. If anything remains, uh, it will be the wide open eyes of the child who can't understand today our shut up worlds and opens his mouth to ask a question. And if the child keeps asking, he'll provide an open testimony of our truth. So uh, I hope there are some young people uh, among the listeners. Uh, perhaps you are the children and you're not children, but you are those people who are asking questions, should be asking those questions in order to understand not only the, the past, uh, but only the future, and not only in East Central Europe, but also elsewhere, uh, perhaps even here in, in the United States uh, of America. Uh, and I have another poem, this time by uh, my uh, good friend, uh, Piotr Zomer, uh, who is a wonderful poet, a wonderful translator of English, Irish, and American poetry into Polish and uh, um, a tour de force in, in Pol Pol Polish criticism. He may be listening to me, I'm not sure. Um, we started together in, uh, in a magazine called Literatura na Świecie, World Literature, when we uh, worked as in, the, in the English language um, uh, section of the, uh, of the translation. You know, it was a magazine of translations, so foreign, foreign literatures translated into Polish. We were responsible for the English language section. He is now the editor-in-chief of this magazine. Um, he uh, probably would not um, consider himself a member of this generation, but he shares some features with them and he's very different than some other features. His uh, poetry is very ironic and self-ironic. And here's a poem called Indiscretions. And it is translated by a British poet, uh, the late DJ Enright. Where are we in ironies that no one will grasp? 
short-lived and unmarked, in trivial points which reduce metaphysics to absurd detail. In Tuesday, that falls on day two of May in the mnemonics of days. You can give an example or take it on faith, a cat's paw on the throat. And one also likes certain words in those, pardon me, syntaxes that pretend that something links them together. Between these intermeanings, the whole man is contained, squeezing in where he sees a little space. Um, let me start here. <laughs> let me start here and uh, perhaps ask for some questions. Um, I have presented a rather gloomy uh, picture of the of, of the of the years. Uh, they were gloomy, uh, but they were also funny in some ways. There was also a time of um, uh, political cabarets. Uh, that was something that uh, that we also enjoyed doing. You know, laughing laughing it off. But it was a very bipolar kind of experience. So um, let's 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 talk about it a little bit more. Thank you so much. It was fantastic to hear you. And thank you so much for building this landscape of 70s, our history of Poland, and going with details to the poetry. I was thinking when you were talking um, about um, cinema of distrust, of cinema of moral concern, which actually followed the new generation. The new generation gave the base for, for Polish cinema. So that was really uh, so good to he hear you. And we have a question actually here. Mm -hmm. Pani Helena Gostiuo, fascinating talk, I agree. So thank you. What connection do you see between the poetry of the new wave and the prose of the era? We can add and the cinema of the era. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I was talking mainly about poets. Uh, all of them actually wrote prose as well. So uh, all of them wrote novels or short stories. So there was a parallel, a parallel um, current in, um, in, 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 uh, in, in prose. Uh, but it was mainly a poet. I mean, uh, I may be missing something, but for me, it was mainly a po poetic, a poetic uh, phenomenon, probably because the time somehow favored short forms of expression, something very brief, something that it's almost like, you know, uh, country, uh, uh, smuggling, uh, smuggling some, something, you know, uh, across the border, you know, it was easier to smuggle meanings uh, in, uh, in, in poetry, in short poems, than in big, uh, big forms, novels, or, or, or longer stories. They were trying to do it, but, but poetry was kind of easier to, 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 to sneak by the censors for a while. Then, of course, it started being more and more difficult. And I, and I said, they, they all paid the price. You know, they were willing to challenge the, unlike the earlier generations and the earlier colleagues, to challenge the, the, the authorities and to push the en envelope to see how far they can go. Uh, and and, and, and paid, they paid the price. You know, they were, they, they were many, for many years publishing only in Samizdat or abroad. Um, uh, Emigrating, coming back, you know, it was it was a very kind of disruptive, disrupted uh, form of life. Uh, film, yes, film, uh, the, the 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 cinema of it was called uh, kino moralnego niepokoju, the cinema of moral uh, unrest, or moral moral. It was very very similar in the mood and in the 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 the, the, the type of uh, the type of uh, situations it was pre presented. It was usually about. Um, uh, Margarita is a much better, better versed in, in, in the history of, of film uh, than I am. But it's usually the, 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 the plot is usually young, young person, enthusiastic person, talented person trying to start a new life, getting a new job, being enthusiastic about it. And then, bam, you know, he's like hit by the reality, forced to compromise, how to, how to do something dishonest, trying not to be, you know, uh, falling apart uh, psychologically. That's, that's the uh, repeated, <clears throat> repeated pattern in, uh, in uh, the poetry of, in, 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 in the movies of uh, Kishlovsky, Zanussi, and uh, uh, Agnieszka Holland, and, and many others of that time, you know. 
Thank you. Uh, we have um, more comments. Everybody, Pan Henryk Czarnecki, I love the very short 60 minutes. Thank you, fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. And then Jordan Salmanovic Long Longever. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. It has been said the Polish theater audience in this time period appreciated irony and rejected and rejected and something happened to my chat. Just a moment. Okay. And rejected the idea the spiritual experiences belonged in the theater. Was this the same in poetry? Could you do this be from the yearning for an honest addressing of reality? I would love to know your thoughts. Thank you. Hmm. I don't know about the theater, you know, the spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, spiritual experience was, well, it's a, <laughs> it's a huge subject, you know, uh, but um, yes, I think there was, um, in, as, as, at least in those years that we're talking about, the 70s, Mm, the focus was on reality, on, on the immediate reality. Uh, of course, everything is spiritual, you know, especially when you're writing poetry. Everything is translated into, into uh, something much larger. And you, in the, as I said, in the best po poems of Baranczyk and Zagajewski of uh, Kornhauser, you see some, some larger perspective into, mm, well, maybe even metaphysical, uh, uh, metaphysical space uh, dimension. Uh, that came to to the fore, you know, when they after the the the, the, the drama of the, of the Polish drama, they kept writing after the fall of communism, or uh, kept writing in in uh, in exile. Uh, but uh, it was it was mostly about what we see, what we see, what we feel, what uh, you know, as, as in this this short verse, you know, what we see in our refrigerator. You know, that's that's the reality, the small things, the details. Uh, the generalization was they were trying to avoid gener generalizations uh, and, and and general idea big ideas great idea ideas you know uh, they are still there but but not not uh, at the, at the, the, the 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 front the front of the uh, of the preoccupation i would say uh, <clears throat> thank you Kathleen, Ms. Kathleen Chofi, thank you so much for your talk. Are you familiar with the theater production of One in One Breath by Teatr Ósmego Dnia, which was based on Varańczak volume? Yes, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I saw this, the spec, I, I, I barely remember it, but but Stalinsa Varańczak was actually the, the literary director of this theater for some uh, for some time, and it staged, uh, staged the, the uh, in one breath, you know, there was the perf a performance. That was the time when, the, you know, the living theater uh, concept uh, uh, came to Poland and there was the, the, the Teatr Ósmego Dnia, the, the theater of the eighth uh, day. There was uh, Teatr Stu, the 100th theater in Krakow, and there were several le less, less, less prominent groups that were doing those mixed performances. You know, they are not the plays, they are not but they were poetry, music, uh, video, um, light, you know, the, the combination of everything, uh, every, every conservative media. Yes, I, I, I remember that I saw uh, this, uh, this performance. I think I saw it in Warsaw, actually, not in Poznan, where the, the, the theater traveled, of course. Um, I, I, I have some glimpses of memory, but not, not, not much, unfortunately. Thank you. And one more, um, Mr. Zakhar Ishov, were, this, were those poets aware of me was the captive mind? Did it resonate with uh, their experience? Was the, he their inspiration? This is uh, Uppsala University, Mr. Mm -hmm. Zakhar Ishov. Well, Miłosz was, of course, Miłosz was uh, persona non grata, N nothing by Miłosz was was being published in those years, but of course books were being smug smuggled in uh, into Poland, uh, uh, especially books by uh, Kultura Paryska, the, the, the Polish Culture Institut Literacki, uh, the Polish publishing house in, in, in Paris, near Paris. Uh, yes, they, they, they knew, they knew, they read Miłosz, uh, not only The Captive Mind, but I think his poetry. Um, it was, it was possible, I remember reading Miłosz and other Banned forbidden, forbidden uh, poets at that time. So yes, Miłosz was a tremendous influence uh, on on uh, on the, the poetry that was uh, somehow um, 
in opposition, you know, and try to be in opposition to, to what they experience around. Uh, in fragments, incomplete, you know, there was never a complete Miłosz, you know, it always, he always came to us in fragments and in individual poems and in individuals whose books that were passed around, you know, in great secrecy uh, only to, uh, to trusted, trusted friends. So it was not easy, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you, you see the influ Miłosz's influence, uh, especially on, on, on Zagajewski, I think. Um, the, uh, probably more than the others, you know, this kind of mm, uh, patient intellectual exposition, you know, looking for the, the, a concept that is cons uh, consistently laid out and, and, and uh, actualized in, in his poetry. I have one more question. What was the reaction uh, for the new wave in Polish literary world? the reaction uh, of the new world in the Polish literary world in of that time. Of the time, at the beginning of, when the new wave arrives. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, uh, it depends on who, who, who was the, 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 the receiver. I mean, people, people of similar interests, you know, people feeding this anxiety uh, the, the past after after 1968 anxiety, and I think there was the large uh, large portion of the Polish intelligentsia uh, accepted to, took it as as the new voice as the, as the new absolutely necessary uh, important uh, voice uh, in, in 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 our culture. Uh, there were some critics, you know, they, they were they were criticized. As I said, you know, the theory was sometimes mm, not really. There, there were gaps in their theory. They they were, did not explain themselves entirely, uh, entirely uh, clearly. They sometimes wrote poems that seemed to contradict what they were what they were asking for. But they were they they dominated the the, the political scene at that time. They dominated the political scene and. Uh, um, there was also, you know, there was this dialogue I, I, I mentioned, you know, their relationship with the classicists, with Herbert. Uh, there is some interesting correspondence going on between them. You know, th there was a lot of mutual respect, uh, some disagreements, some differences, but a lot of mutual respect uh, and, and, uh, and support between generations. And then the new generation came in the, in the, in the 90s, and it was a slightly different, uh, different story. They wanted to, to, to um, separate themselves from anything that everything that that came be, be, be before them including the new wave but that's a separate rather a rather complex uh, subject that we may have a chance to talk about sometime thank Great. you one more um what is your this is a kind of personal question what is your favorite poet and uh, poem uh, uh, her or his poem what is your favorite <laughs> it's a very tricky question. It's like asking a parent, you know, who's, uh, which, which child do you love most? Um, I like all of them. And uh, as I said, they are different and they have different strengths. Um, I like uh, Richard Krynicki uh, a lot. Uh, this, 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 is, this is a really a poet, po poet that, that presents a whole, you know, a range of, uh, of, of, of talents and abilities. Um, He's still writing, as far as I know. Uh, although he and his wife are now running a very, um, uh, in, very interesting small niche publishing house, poetic publishing house. Um, uh, Eva Lipska is is uh, oh, she is uh, you know when I was reading a lot of poetry uh, preparing for this for his talk, I was I was struck about how uh, how. Uh, interesting and how uh, how mesmerizing her poetry is you know it is a really uh, powerful voice that deserves uh, more attention uh, but i like others i mean uh, uh, cornhouse i mentioned you know i like him for this humanity this this kind of tongue chicken uh, tongue in cheek uh, um, humanity you know uh, which is true which is real you know uh, and um, and uh, Zagajewski and, and Baranczak, of course, you know they are they are they are uh, very very interesting. Especially, I, I like the, the later later poems. You know those uh, past new wave. Mm -hmm. well, Stasiak is, is, is was was great in every any 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 part of any 
part of his career, any phase of his career, you know, was was very. Uh, Adam Adam is also also uh, incredibly uh, prolific and 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 an interesting uh, poet that moves through various various genres and various mo modes very very easily. So all of all of them are my my favorites. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any questions, so we will actually, um, unfortunately, running out of time also. I would like to thank you very much for this fascinating talk and Ms. Zadvorna for organizing it and also the Kosciuszko Foundation. Uh, it was an enormous pleasure, pleasure to hear it. Thank you so much. I also join everyone in thanking <laughs> Jaroslav Anders for a very insightful, interesting, and very, very informative presentation. Uh, we learned a lot. For all of our participants, uh, the next meeting and the next talk by Jaroslav Anders is scheduled at, I believe, the first week of April. Uh, we'll keep you posted. Uh, earlier on February 23rd at 3 p.m., we will be hosting another webinar also dedicated to poetry, um, Anna Freilich Zions a New York-based poet, scholar, mm. educator. I will be speaking with uh, Ross Ufberg, who is the translator of Marek Huasco's Beautiful 20-somethings. They will be discussing decades of reading and writing and Anna, Anna Freilich's recent, most recent book, The Ghost of Shakespeare. So if you have time then, please join us. Uh, it's Tuesday, February 23rd. Also the same as with this webinar, we'll do the recording and everything is posted on the Kościuszka Foundation's YouTube channel, which is Kościuszka TV. In the meantime, thank you once again. Thank you all very much for fantastic presentations, for participations. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day, wonderful weekend. Stay safe, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.